first question is one topic of contention amongst Marxists is the question of whether or not there are currently any states that have built or are in the process of building socialism currently. What is your view on this issue? There are still significant remnants of the series of uh, socialist countries that arose in the 20th century. On the whole, the Democratic uh, uh, Republic of uh, People's Republic of Korea is, is a socialist country. Cuba has certain significant socialist features. Uh, these so-called remnants can be appreciated for our having outlived the former socialist countries that have taken the, the capitalist road for many decades already. Thank you, that was a great answer. Uh, second question, uh, on a similar note, which countries would you say historically developed socialism or uh, engaged in socialist construction? They include the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of Mongolia, China, Vietnam, uh, DPRK, German Democratic Republic, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Cuba, Democratic Kampuchea, and Laos. You can supply any country that I have overlooked. Cool. I think maybe uh, we could include Albania in there. That was another country I know that developed socialism. Um, the third question is, which countries today uh, would you define as having reached uh, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism? You have the traditional ones, the UK, US, Canada, Germany, Japan, France, Netherlands, Belgium, and the like, and the new ones, Russia and China. Uh, so, the fourth question, uh, a trend I have observed emerging on the left lately in particular, uh, a trend which I also observe to be a harmful and revisionist one, and one which often leads to electoralism, is so-called uh, lesser evilism. For instance, last year, many self-proclaimed leftists advocated for voting for Joe Biden due to the fact that, in their view, this would be better than Donald Trump, uh, ignoring completely Biden's own heinous imperialist record. Inevitably, this, is, this has led to men, many to proclaim that socialism can be won by voting alone. What, could, what would your advice be to combat this and the modern revisionism of today more broadly? You are correct in describing uh, Biden uh, and criticizing those who have obscured this rapid imperialist track record. It remains important and necessary to keep an ideological Marxist-Leninist Maoist stand against bourgeois reformism and electoralism, as well as against modern revisionism. However, there may be political flexibility in allowing anti-imperialist solidarity with certain countries which assert national independence and have socialist aspirations even if they were previously associated with uh, uh, Soviet modern revisionism. The correctness of the Marxist-Leninist critique of modern revisionism is well proven by the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Dengist counter-revolution and capitalist restoration in China. We must recognize that the world proletarian revolution or socialist cause has suffered a big setback since its peak before 1956 and the U.S. became the sole superpower from 1991 onward and rode high on the policies of anti-communism, neo-colonialism, neoliberalism, state terrorism, neoconservatism, endless wars of aggression. Most importantly, we must recognize that all these policies have gone bankrupt and have in fact accelerated the strategic decline of the U.S., in the 21st century and the current rise of anti-imperialist and democratic mass struggles on a global scale, which are generating conditions for the rise of proletarian revolutionary parties and the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. Thank you very much for that answer. That's a very, very fascinating answer. 
Uh, question number five. Uh, of course, many communist parties have succumbed to modern revisionism, uh, including non-ruling communist parties. In your opinion, uh, how or if even can we rebuild the communist parties that have been taken by revisionism? Communist parties that succumbed to modern revisionism underwent various ways of completely ending their pretense of being communist. Outside the revisionist ruled countries, some communist parties completely disintegrated after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and others split with one part trying to be social democratic and the other part becoming a dwindling club of old folks. Within the former revisionist ruled countries, the previous ruling communist parties were generally put out of existence or put aside by the bourgeois parties. Some of the assets of the CPSU were conceded to its Russian replacement, and the latter persisted as a declining castrated revisionist party. In China, the Communist Party has been taken over by the bourgeoisie since the Dengis counter-revolution, which expelled all genuine communists and enrolled the supporters of capitalist restoration. It continues as the center of political authority and legitimator of the state and economy dominated by the partnership of the monopoly bureaucrat capitalist and the private monopoly capitalist. It is impossible to rebuild the old revisionist parties and convert them to genuine communist parties after so many decades of disintegration or decline. Many of the old revisionist folks are either dead or too old. It is more effective to build communist parties by bringing together those groups and individuals who have been guided by Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and recruit and develop party members from the ranks of advanced activists in the current anti-imperialist and democratic mass organizations and movements. It is fine if there is already a Marxist-Leninist-Baoist party that one can join in a certain country. If none, such a party should be built. The founders can start with the advanced elements of the current mass movement and who wish to build a new Marxist-Leninist-Maoist party. Yeah, thank you for that answer. That was a very long and detailed answer. Uh, and I think, yeah, that answer was very helpful. Uh, one question I would like to ask you, um, considering the work I am currently doing and have done on the topic, and considering the fact that we are uh, we we have we are in the tenth anniversary of the imperialist NATO assault on Libya, uh, is what is your opinion on uh, Muammar Gaddafi and the present day green resistance movement uh, movement of those who were loyal to Gaddafi who fought NATO imperialism and colonialism? Mama. Gaddafi was a great anti-imperialist leader. For decades, he fought hard against NATO imperialism and colonialism. Thus, the US, UK, France, and NATO imperialism did everything to attack and overthrow his government. Gaddafi enabled democratic reforms and provided substantial social benefits to the people from the oil income of Libya. It is important for the green resistance movement to cherish perpetuate and develop the legacy of Gaddafi. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, next question. Uh, the previous question could also be linked to the broader question of should communists support non-communist but still progressive anti-imperialist, uh, anti-colonialist movements and governments such as, for instance, the Polisario Front in the Sahara the, and the anti-imperialist uh, resistance in Yemen. What is your stance on this? Of course, communists should engage in anti-imperialist solidarity, alliance, mutual support, and cooperation with non-communist, progressive, and anti-imperialist movements and governments, like the Polisario Front and the anti-imperialist resistance in Yemen. It would be dogmatism for communists to impose ideological principles on all types of uh, uh, relations and policies in the political field. Of course, there are many 
many revolutionary struggles, including people's wars and wars of national liberation ongoing all around the world today. Which countries would you identify as currently having strong revolutionary potential? And do you envisage any ongoing people's wars being victorious in the near future? The most outstanding people's wars and wars of national liberation include those in India, Philippines, Nepal, West Papua, uh, Myanmar, Turkey, Kurdistan, Donbas region, Palestine, Colombia, and Peru. All of them have a, have a strong revolutionary potential. We must grasp the point that the world capitalist system is in the throes of an unprecedented crisis due to the aggravation of the crisis of overproduction, the imperialist policies against the working class and against the oppressed peoples and nations. The various forms of anti-imperialist and democratic struggles have burst out all over the world and are favorable to all forms of revolutionary struggle and the resurgence of the world proletarian socialist revolution. Um, another trend that has been emerging amongst some, particularly amongst some self-described Maoists, is a trend known as third worldism. This essentially is the view that the first world has no revolutionary potential. Some third worldists go as far to say that there is no proletariat in the first world and that the entire population of the first world constitutes a labor aristocracy. What is your view on this school of thought? Uh, I do not agree with the trend known as third worldism, which is submit dismissive of the revolutionary potential of the proletariat in the industrial capitalist countries. I do not agree with such notions as that the first world has no revolutionary potential, that there is no proletariat in the first world, and that the entire population of the first world constitutes a labor aristocracy. These notions are nonsense. The crisis of capitalist countries, aggravated by the neoliberal policy of unbridled greed, is now characterized by the extreme exploitation and oppression of the working class, the dwindling of the so-called middle class, and the precarity and economic proletarianization of the petty bourgeoisie. What is needed now in the industrial capitalist countries is the building of proletarian revolutionary parties that can generate and intensify the campaigns to arouse, organize, and mobilize the proletariat and people against monopoly capitalism and for democracy and socialism. In your view, for revolutionaries in Europe and the first world more broadly, what revolutionary strategy do you think we should pursue? In Europe and the entire first world, uh, meaning to say, we've been using the term first world, meaning to say the, the developed countries or the industrial capitalist countries, you cannot avoid engaging first in building the genuine communist party and the mass movement and striving to win the battle for democracy against everything that the monopoly bourgeoisie can throw at the proletariat, including the coercive apparatuses of the state, and the ideas of anti-communism, conservatism, liberalism, social democracy, neoliberalism, and fascism. It is only through the process of mass struggles that you can strengthen the Communist Party, the mass organizations, and the organizations of self-defense in mass organizations and communities. There must be such organizations for self-defense and Bolshevik-style efforts to send cadres into the reactionary army. A communist party that tries to start any kind of armed revolution without any strong and wide mass base, without self-defense organizations, and without the ruling system being sufficiently weakened, weakened by systematic crisis and imperialist war, will be smashed in a matter of days or even hours. Only the infantile type of Maoist and agents and agent provocateur can suggest waging a protracted people's war in industrial capitalist countries in which the rural population is less than 5% of the national population and consists of rich peasants and farm workers employed mainly by uh, farm 
capitalists and corporations. So far, no group of infantile Maoists has launched an armed revolution in either cities or countryside of any imperialist uh, countries for more than 20 years. In the past, inter-imperialist wars like World War I and II provided favorable conditions for partisan warfare in both urban and rural areas in Europe. But uh, the imperialist powers themselves have avoided direct inter-imperialist wars because of their fear of mutually assured destruction with the use of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction. The inter-imperialist policy in the last more than 70 years has been to shift the burden of capitalist crisis to the third world countries and to unleash aggressive wars against recalcitrant countries in the third world. It is therefore of great importance to, co to correlate and encourage the interactive development of revolutionary mass struggles of various forms in both developed and underdeveloped countries of the world. One particularly disturbing trend that has been emerging recently is the rise of right-wing anti-communist propaganda as well as rising fascism. What is your advice on how to combat this? The emergence of right-wing anti-communist propaganda and fascist groups is a clear sign that, the mono that monopoly capitalism is in a grave crisis and that the monopoly bourgeoisie is promoting and funding the rise of the ultra-reactionary trend and groups in order to preempt and block the rise of the anti-imperialist, democratic and socialist uh, movements. The way to combat the anti-communist and fascist trend and groups is to build the revolutionary part of the proletariat, raise the revolutionary consciousness of the proletariat and entire people about the crisis of capitalism and the need for immediate reforms as well as the need for socialist revolution. Organize various types of mass organizations as well as organizations of community self-defense and self-defense groups within mass organizations and keep on mobilizing more people in campaigns against capitalism and imperialism and for democracy and socialism. Uh, as you know, uh, there are many different tendencies amongst the left anti-capitalist movement, uh, including, for instance, anarchism. Many on the left of recent have been proposing an idea called left unity, that is, the unity of all sections of the left, from Marxist, Leninist, Maoists to anarchists. What is your opinion on this idea? Any alliance that may be called left unity can be firm in principle against a common enemy, that is imperialism, together with all its, its monstrosities like neoliberalism, fascism, state terrorism, and wars of aggression. But there must be political flexibility to allow the unity of communists and non-communists. Their parties and organizations have independence and initiative and agree on the basis of consensus and broad political principles and policies. The Alliance may have a consultative and consensual committee or secretariat to coordinate meetings and mass actions. The Alliance should not include any entity whose sole or main objective is to disrupt or prevent the Alliance. Thank you very much. I believe that is, in fact, the end of the interview. Um, that was a fascinating interview, very insightful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, too. You're very welcome.